It's a pleasure to be here. First time in Mexico, so I'm really enjoying the temperature. Thing. So thank you so much for having me. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I have this title that you will only probably understand at the very end of the talk, while it's the cradle of the cradles of planets. It's kind of uh, provocative. And since I guess most of you are not in the field, they are the students uh, or people not in the field, I have a very, very long introduction to try to get everybody more or less on the same page and try to understand what is observationally mostly the planet formation but also some some on, on, the, on the theory and i have this double uh, cover page because i didn't know what to put i typically use this because this is a very important object in our field and i will show you why in particular this object here is the first of this class to ever be discovered it's the first protoplanet so it's the first planet information Ever discovered. And this guy here is actually the father of modern astronomy. You may know him as Galileo Galilei. The reason why I put this is because I am from, you know, typically when I give talks so far away from home, I actually have this uh, introduction to try to explain. Uh, most of you who accept the designation that was born actually a few kilometers from here. Uh, what is actually Firenze or exactly that shape? So this is Firenze, Florence. This is on the hill of Alcetri, where the observatory. Uh, of INA, the Institute of National the Astrophysica, is so it's pretty close uh, in, uh, in the Mexican standard for sure, super big <laughs> for the city. And uh, it's a wonderful place. You can see here, this is the observatory here, from, uh, I guess from uh, the drone view, probably. And you can see you from this side here, we can see the city, the dome from the city, the entire city. And did you see here where the car are, you can see the other part, basically the Toscan Calcasa, which is also. An amazing place, and you can imagine. And uh, here, where the arrow is, it's actually Galileo's figure, where Galileo died around 400 years ago. And uh, 400, maybe more, more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, uh, so this is actually the under the management of the University of Vienna. Basically, you can actually walk there without the keys. We can organize conferences and uh, and uh, and so on. So. Uh, just you know, to introduce uh, Galileo and actually uh, exploit uh, this um, uh, very famous sentence actually spoken said by somebody else, not really by by him. So you know, he recounted. Yeah, I didn't know this was before in English. How do you say in Spanish recount? Uh, I don't know. Well, basically, okay, that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he basically recounted and uh, I spent the rest of his life under arrest in in uh, in Archie. After that, even though you know it was really, you had to say that because you don't want to die, of course, but then the end, and yet it moves, right? I'm still convinced it's not really 
the earth in the middle, the sun in the middle, and the earth is rotating. So it keeps this, and yet it moves. And you know, in Italian, we always say, you know, a pussy walk, you know, and yet it moves. When you say, okay, whatever, you're right, but yeah, yet it moves. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so me, no parallels with Galileo and of course, just to introduce what, what I am. And mostly work in the visible, in the near infrared. So basically, this instrument here, our near infrared telescope, this is from the BNT, it's run by European Telephone Observatory. And I mostly work in the field of planet formation. So I plan, improve, analyze high resolution images, in particular high contrast images, and I will tell you what this means in uh, the field to try to basically uh, understand the, the planet formation. So this is the outline of the talk. I have the first uh, pretty long introduction to the field, which is the planet formation in theory and in particular in observations. Then I will show you some findings that we have had, especially in the last decade, which has been really a revolution in our field because of high resolution images. Um, and then the third part is actually a new paper from, uh, from me and collaborators, which is actually the title of the talk, the cradle of the cradle of, of planets. So section one, planet formation, theory, and observation. I always start with this uh, 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 bullet list, basically. So planet formation in a natural and from a natural, because we start from actually even less than a natural, and then we have to form a planet. What do we know? We know that the majority of solar light stars host planets. Numbers can be discussed, but it's certainly a very large number. So, planet formation is efficient, okay? And the planetary system we observed are very varied. We know that the solar system is at least not common. So, somehow the planet formation is diversified. Many processes involved, and somehow you can meet very different planetary systems. For the planetary disk, which is where planets form, live a few mega years most of the time. So, basically, planet formation is fast. At least the giant planet formation like Jupiter or more planets must be formed very fast. However, our models show a number of barriers, and I will show you in particular one, in principle prevent the dust from growing from the interstellar media, interstellar matter dust grain to the Earth. So planet formation only you know, is not understood because in principle we believe the planets should not form, however, they do form, right? So this in particular is the most important barrier. First, keep in mind when we have when we take our dust grain from the interstellar uh, medium and we have to basically grow into the size of the planet, this is a journey of around 14 orders of magnitude. It's huge, right? We start from the micron size or even less, and we want to get to the megameter, we're gonna get to thousands of kilometers, right? So it's a huge travel. And as far as I understand from theories, this part here is pretty easy, right? Dust can grow pretty easily from coagulation, and we can even see, you know, the dust in our places and so on. This is also pretty easy, because at some point, when the objects are large enough, the gravitation starts to take over, right? So you have this uh, planetesimal or planetary embryo, which basically can really attract gas and more, more dust. So at this part here, we get this runaway accretion, which is pretty easy. Also, no, because we have intermediate size. This is the most critical part, actually. And that's unfortunate. For the theorists, it's actually the part that is not observed. Right? We cannot really directly observe a uh, uh, 10 meter part. Right? We can observe a micro size of the millimeter of the We can observe planets, but we cannot observe this table. Right? We cannot observe something that is even a kilometer size. We cannot observe a Morelia like uh, object. So, this is basically the meter barrier, unfortunately, that we're going to describe in the next slide. It's really sitting here, which is actually the reason we are not, uh, we are actually blind. Okay, and we cannot really probe. So, and uh, this is the most important obstacle in the formation of planets. So, the meter barrier is actually an expression of two different phenomena, I believe. One is actually this very old paper from the 70s, basically showing this is a velocity and this is a particle radius of, of, um, of the particles. The radius of the particle is a centimeter. So, basically, this is telling you what is the drift velocity of particles toward the star. So, we've got our complex dynamics in our disk. Our gas is slightly subcaplarian, okay? It's not really caplarian. It's slightly subcaplarian. So the dust wants to rotate caplarian around the, the, around the star, but it cannot because it feels this gas basically slowing down. Now it feels like a happening. So the, the tendency is basically that these grains are braked and therefore are uh, moved toward the star. Everything that basically breaks moves toward the star. And actually, that being calculated, that this effect is most dramatic for the particles of uh, around one meter, a few centimeters, one meter, and so it's a peak here. 
very large velocity for a meter size, this table would migrate toward the star very rapidly. Okay, that means basically this table here would not have time to become a kilometer or tens of kilometer large body because it's too fast, this drift. And the other is when this table encounters another table, the net effect of the encounter is actually the red part here, so a negative outcome. Okay? Very small grains tend to stick together. That's the green part. You've got mass transfer, sticking, and so on. But at some point, when you get to the meter size, when this table encounters another table, they tend to destroy each other instead of sticking together. So basically, you get to the table, and then you're done. There's no way in principle to get over it. This is the meter bar. There is something we have to understand in order to overcome this meter barrier. Otherwise, we're not understanding the planet formation. Okay? So the final message is and the active points, right? And the active moves, and the active form. So, okay, whatever planets are not forming, but yeah, they are formed, right? So as an observer, I need to understand, we need to understand that why is that? And to look at the moment where planets form, to try to understand how they do. Okay, we want to see this. So back to the initial question. We said planet formation is efficient. Okay, so how do planets form? How and where are these barriers overcome somehow by nature? Planet formation is diversified. And this is kind of a trick question I have. How could the initial condition affect the planetary architecture? Can we in principle predict, given the initial planet forming disk or protoplanetary disk, how the final planetary system would look like or not? So it's a two components. Planet formation is fast. Okay, so obvious question when in the disk lifetime do planets form? And finally, planet formation is not understood. Okay, can we see? Can we actually see directly the planet formation in order to understand the planet formation? And this is what we want to do. We want to see directly the planet formation. This is direct imaging. This is high resolution imaging. Because keep in mind that one of some of the key features of planet forming disks, they are short living. Okay, they live in most of few mega years. So astronomically wise, they are very short living, they are rare. We most define it in some formal regions, like this one here, it's Orion, as you can imagine. And most, most subformal regions are actually at least 150 parsec away from us. They are not super gross, not 5 parsec or 10 parsecs away. They are small, 15, 150 AU in radius, something like that. I put it for a map, that's actually really easy. And this is very important, not if you work with ALMA, it's very important if you work in the visible and the near infrared. They are very close to a star. The star is always the dominating source of photons. Okay? No way around, there's no planet, there's no disk that would be brighter than the star itself. So, this is the elephant in the room, we got the star. So, some pretty easy map you can easily obtain. And basically, if you want to have a result map, if you want to see the planet formation, you need to have high resolution in. So, somehow for me, high resolution means that around 0 0.1 arc second. Okay? You want to have something that can produce a map of our planet formation with this resolution here. And, uh, well, you may know that this is actually can be done uh, mostly from the ground. Again, I will also have James Webb, but mostly from the ground and uh, with uh, light. So basically, two completely different regimes. This is near infrared optical, and this, as you know, is two millimeter, millimeter wavelengths. Most of my job is actually on this part here. I have had some radio with Alma, and say my expertise is really on the on this object, like for example, the very last telescope in Chile, uh, run by the uh, European Southern Observatory. So, optical and millimeter observation, right? On one hand, uh, uh, the BNT, for example, and the other, ALMA. This is the typical sketch of the planet forming this. We got the star in the middle, and then we got our gas and dust all around the, our star. And we must keep in mind that when we probe, uh, when we observe an optical millimeter, we probe completely different disk regions and components. This region, because you know, in the visible, the tau equal one, so that the, mm -hmm. the optical and the uh, opaque space basically is obtained very high, so it's basically the it's super optical thick with this, right? We cannot really observe inside, we only observe the surface when we observe the optical. Whereas with ALMA, we actually go a little bit deeper, we may even go through this midway. So, and also in the optical and millimeter, we tend to probe smaller grains because you know, smaller wavelengths, smaller grains. So typically around micro size dust grains. Whereas in the millimeter, we mostly probe millimeter dust grains. Okay, so we probe completely different uh, components in the disk. And also with that, you can probe gas, of course, right? So your, your line uh, <coughs> will emit in the sub millimeter. Um, okay, so how do we actually observe planet forming disk in the near infrared and in the visible? We've got three problems. The first one, 
disks and planets are small. The second, the effect of the atmosphere is destructive. There is something, also some problem with Alma, but it's a minor problem, whereas in the visible, the atmosphere is really destructive. I mean, we need to somehow correct for the effect of the atmosphere. The first problem is overcome by an exoskeleton. That's the best we can do, but we'll have something much better very soon, as you probably know. The second is actually tackled with adaptive optics. So what is actually this? The idea is really to take what we observe exactly, which is basically a completely contaminated point of expansion. You know? So you got your incoming beam, which is, and then the point of expansion is basically the response of the instrument of the telescope, this incoming beam. But then this is completely blurred because the atmosphere, 1,000 times a second, will completely change you know, your, your, your PSF. You can see by eye, right? Your, your, your star will swing, basically, you know? And uh, so you need to correct this in order to obtain your actual points per punch, okay? And to do it, we use these adaptive optics techniques. I don't know really the detail, but the, you know, the basic principle is just that, you know, we have our incoming distorted wave from, 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 uh, from the star, and this is actually analyzed by a computer. This computer can actually try to correct for this, and to do it, it actually tells that the form of the mirror to adapt in order to correct for this. This is like at 1,000 times every second. Okay? It's here, it's a uh, frequency. So this, the form of a mirror here will actually adapt every second 1,000 times in order to basically correct for all this motion, like the laser that I'm doing now, to basically get to steady PSF. Okay? So this is adaptive optics, and the latest generation has done a great, great job to actually correct for this uh, as if we were outside of the AA atmosphere. It's not really like that, but it's more, we have obtained very, very good uh, results. Third problem, okay, number one, number two, the third one, as I mentioned before, in the near infrared, the star is the primary source of photons. okay? So a typical example, if you want to observe a planet, for example, around the star, is as if you wanted to observe uh, uh, fireflies around uh, a light up, if you, if you want to do. It's not only a matter of zoom, but you also have to get rid of the standard light, of the light of the light up, otherwise you cannot get to see uh, the, 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 the mosquito. The size of the so we need basically high contrast. High contrast basically need you have a high contrast between what you want to observe and stuff. So basically what you want to get rid of. So you can use a coronagraph, that's the you know, physical stuff you can put in front of the central part of your star, which is kind of uh, obvious, but you know you still have this um, halo basically, which is you know the, the outer part of your PSF, which is still present. So coronagraph by itself is not enough. And we have developed a number of techniques that we call differential image. So basically, cross production. We go after the, the, the data taken, we sit with our computer and then try to do some trick. We we'll call differential imaging in order to get rid of the cellular light and be left with the image of the disk or the plant, whatever we want to observe around the star. I'm not going into the detail. There are a number of differential imaging here. This is probably too technical for the audience here. You can only you may only notice, for example, that each of these is good for different uh, targets. So for example, this is a disk and this is a planet. So this one here is good for both. This is only good for planets. What is most important for this talk is the polarimetric differential image. It's basically good for planets. So how does this work? The basic idea is pretty simple. You know that the, the light from your star is mainly unpolarized, right? It's basically a direct light from your black body uh, emitter. Whereas the scattered light from this, so some photos will actually travel. Do I have an next slide of this? No? Okay. Uh, so the photo will travel from the star, will be scattered by the disk. And as you know, all the scattered light in nature is largely polarized. Okay, so we have two different lights, one from the star unpolarized, and one from the scattered light on the disk which is polarized. Okay, so we put the polarimeter at our telescope, we do some math, and basically we get rid of anything that is not polarized, star be left with everything that's polarized, the scattered light from the disk. This is the most efficient way to actually image directly disk around the bright star. Okay? So we go to our 8-meter telescope. This is a, a comprehensive uh, a list of the 8-meter telescope with adaptive optics and we have at the moment from the ground. And these are the three where we have a polarimeter. Actually, I think I right now it's decommissioned, so we are left with basically sphere, which is what I'm be using for most of my research is at the VLT in uh, at Telephone Analogy, 
And this is Gemini Planet Imager from uh, the American side, actually. So Europe, Europe versus uh, America. Um, as you can see, you know, the journey, the quality of the images that we have taken this journey is impressive. We started with the first pioneering images with adaptive optics, and we started to see something that was looked like a disk. This is from Hubble, which is great, of course, but unfortunately, you can see the most interesting part, which is where planets form, was not accessible. Okay, so we could only see this very large disk, but basically we were ignoring the inner part. So finally, with the later generation, like BLT Napa, for example, that was mentioned, or with the super high tower, finally with the VLT sphere, we are obtaining better and better images. You can see the quality of this disk, right? You can really see the, the substructure of this disk here. So this is where our extremely large telescope image will sit in a few years. A, it's not only a matter of quality, it's also a matter of quantity, of course, as of many scientists in astronomy. You can see the first disk observable like a bunch, you know, like a few, less than 10, and then probably 20 or so. And then we have had the explosion in the number of individual these individual uh, objects observed with the VLT sphere, which have an image with our service. And actually, this should be updated to uh, 250. So here, you know, we are really kind of exponentially growing the number of individual disks observed. And we are also improving in the coverage in terms of stellar parameters that we are actually probing. For example, you can see the blue point here in 2015 were mostly. Right. That be all the massive stars, and now we are really uh, probing uh, lower and lower mass stars in some of the region, and the younger and younger, so probably the most uh, similar stars to our sun, okay? Even actually lower mass. Okay, so this is kind of introduction of how we actually observe uh, uh, planet forming disks. And now we have some of the results that we have obtained over the last 10 years or so. This is indeed what Carlos would mention. This is actually my first paper in astronomy ever. The first paper ever, actually, from 2013, where this was well, actually one of the first discs obtained where we could clearly see the substructure, right? You can see the spiral like here, you got the star in the middle, there's probably a cavity here where we don't have much dust or so. And then we obtain other images, you can clearly see, okay, oh, a substructure here, substructure here, substructure here. Crazy, we were lucky enough to get the three discs with substructure, we thought at that time. <laughs> but Danish and Tau and the other images probably also came online and so we saw, oh, okay, that's another one. So this is actually even younger. This is a very young disk, less than one mega year. So it's super embedded in the natal cloud where it was born, where the star was born. So and then we saw this and we're like, okay, all these whole planets so crazy. We again have substructure in this disk. Now we basically know that most, if not all, disks post substructure. Okay, we're not lucky at that time, it's just all of them. If a disk is bright and extended enough, it does show to the truck, to the comet. Okay, so this is the collection of the images that we took with the technique that I explained, the solarimetric differential image. Okay, so basically the stellar contribution is uh, canceled because it's uh, polarized and we're left in the scatter light, in the polarized scatter light from the disk. And this is a collection that we made together for a chapter from an important conference about the Southern Planets uh, conference last year. Where you can see like a variety of substructure, like you have your spiral, you got this shadow, probably you got these rings and so on. So very complex morphologies. And then the same for Alma, we are going for very different components. So once again, larger dust rings and the big thing, but once again, you got rings, you got some spirals, even in some case, azimutal asymmetries, cavities, and so on. So the question now is, okay, practically all bright and extended dish substructures. Initially we thought, okay, every of this substructure is due to a planet there, a former planet. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not. Probably uh, some of these are actually due to planets, not all of them. But it can also be the other way around. They can also be the cause of planets. And how there could be some particular processes that may be, you know, collecting particles or creating some instabilities in this dish from which we form plants. So somehow these substructure are clearly a signature of something uh, dynamical and dynamically active that's going on, but we don't know whether it's a consequence of planets or the cause for plants. In principle, both of them, or no, none of the two. But this is what we need to understand. Okay, this is again a catch we put together to summarize all the features that we have, like spirals, 
you know, this, this shadow here is basically this inner part of the disk, and we cannot get close. This is really super close to the south, so let's say one astronomical units or so. So it's even uh, smaller than the resolution that we have, the angular resolution. But this may be casting a shadow outside that we see, right? Like in this belt here. So we can actually indirectly probe this dust belt because we see the effect of this on the outer region, the shadow cast by the outer region. And then we got rings with maybe a planet or not. And then we got these large cavities with maybe a planet or not. And then some of these can actually be very faint because maybe they are globally shadowed by the inner part of the disk. So this is somehow the synopsis of the many features that we have. Something that we must keep in mind is that we have a lot of uh, uh, evidence, we have much, much evidence that actually tells us that when we observe this disk, here I'm going back to show you again, when we observe this disk here, most of these, I believe, as well. These are called class two objects. So basically, this where the natal envelope is already gone. That is the basis we are left with the disk. So these class two objects here are put in this um, diagram here. We basically have the mass of the individual uh, planetary system ever discovered. And then you have the average of the mass of this disk. Class zero and one of those are still embedded in this natal envelope. Class two are those that we observe in the near infrared, where basically this angle of this gun, and most of our science is actually do uh, as an observer in the visible on the class two object, where we thought the planet may be forming, but this is actually telling that actually planets have already formed. Why is that? Because if you compare the mass of this with the mass of planets, it's clear that we cannot form this planet here on this mass, right? We have less mass than what is actually available. We have some caveats on this, uh, of course, I know some criticism and so on, but this is only one of the many pieces of evidence that we have to support the idea that when we observe a planet forming this, as I showed you, this is actually already posted in a planet. Please. Uh, <clears throat> what can you define exactly as solid and how can you calculate that mass? I think this is just the sum of individual planets in a system. Once Solar mass of planets? In no, the... because this is stellar mass. Sorry, the x axis is a stellar mass. Yeah. And this is the mass of the. Uh, uh, okay. So this is dirt masses. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the 100 masses, 1000 masses. As a function of the stellar mass, which mm -hmm. is not super useful, say, in this regard. It's just to show you know in different stellar people. What is important is actually the y axis. Does it mean that uh, you don't form planets so efficiently in. Uh, uh, in higher uh, stellar masses? Yeah. Uh, uh, possibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the questions we have. It's not really my field, but one of the things is that I, now they are actually finding some, some plants, but on average, I think it's much, I don't know, it's, it's also much harder. I don't know whether it's uh, there's also some um, technical limit. But if you look at transit, there shouldn't be any, if you look at Kepler, there shouldn't be any problem. So I think it's intrinsic that you have less planets around very massive stuff. That should be... It should be very different than a uh, 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 eclipse in a, in a very, very bright uh, star. Yeah. Ten solar mass star. It should be very difficult to see. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a technical limit. It's not intrinsic like that. And also you need a very big planet in order to see something spectroscopically. Sure, yeah. But I also fear that the, you know, the evolution of this around the massive star is very fast. Because you got a lot of photo evaporation you know, from, the, from the star and so on. So there are also theories believe you know, that the, the, the lifetime of the disk around the massive star is so fast, basically you got it's harder to form plants. That's I don't know whether this is proven. We have we have actually would work on this, uh, but uh, there could be for sure less uh, less planets around the stars. Anyway, going back to the initial point, the point is that when you observe class two objects, you must have already formed these planets, right? Because the mass of this planet would be larger than what we observe. So, where are the planets? First, we need to consider that actually the mass that we observe may not be the ultimate one. This is what actually we believed 10 years ago, but then now we have a new protagonist, a new uh, uh, character, which is actually the presence of streamers. Well, stream is basically this uh, elongated structure that seems to be feeding the disk. They come from the interstellar material. And they seem to be really interaction with the disk and possibly to be accreting onto the disk. This is an example here. And, uh, so basically what we have to keep in mind, disks are not 
isolated. Okay, the still interaction with the medium, so the branching material uh, should be detected, and this may add new mass to the system. So, you know, when you look at this, okay, look at maybe this is the, the mass now, but you know, you have more mass available. So this is one of the, the possible explanations also for this. Um, yeah, I also want to mention one of my papers, for example, where we have this, this from Alma. So basically, you have the continuum here, your disk, and this, you know, is uh, the moment one. So basically, you from the velocity of the of the, the gas, so you have blue shifted and blue shifted with the disk, and you can see here we, we have this uh, kind of detection of something what we call streamer. Okay, it seems to be connecting with the disk. But the fancy thing was that we also detected these white contours here. These white contours were actually a molecule, SO, uh, sulfur monoxide. And basically, uh, I'm learning from my my chemist friends. It's actually a proof of shock. So typically, these molecules are very well tied when you will lock onto the grain. So you need basically a shock to get this molecule to be dissolved from this, but be released from this, from this dust grain. And so the idea of this paper was really we were observing the shock induced by this incoming streamer on the disk. And this, this kind of object, I think, is the first time that was ever detected. So this is really telling, okay, this streamer is really breathing onto the disk. Okay, it's so possible that this disk have this replenishing material. But the final point is that somehow we should be detected from a plant, okay? Most of these objects should have already formed plants. Do we? Yes and no. Yes, because we have finally detected the first protoplanets ever. This happened five years ago, six years ago or so. So, and was done with, with sphere. So, you know, this uh, uh, high contrast imager uh, instrument I use, also polarimeter, but not only. So what, what are we looking at? Again, the star is in the middle, we can basically cancel all the contribution from the star, and we are left with see this here in the large cavity, black here is a large cavity from the disk, and we found this thermal light from something that is really sitting within this cavity. <clears throat> so the idea is that, okay, this is really a companion, the mass can be somehow calculated with some models, and the idea is that we have finally found a protoplanet, so a planet in the actual form or that recently formed somehow, that some, may be also responsible for this cavity. Maybe you know it really sculpt, it will really carve out you know, the, the, this cavity here. And this was the first detection of a protoplanet ever, so a planet in the actual form. And that was great, and actually the story continues for this very object, because you know, the, the next year, the last enough, but, uh, this was uh, from Miriam Kepler. Kepler is not the instrument, it's a uh, person, I'm speaking of Kepler. Uh, Sebastian Asher detected actually a H alpha from another uh, kind of steam, which news, and found a lot of H alpha in correspondence of this plant. So, H alpha is basically, you know, hydrogen line may be probing accretion on the plant. So, the idea is that, okay, great, so we are really seeing the planet, and we also see some gas that is still accreting on the planet. So, like a Jupiter, or actually more than a Jupiter like planet, which is still collecting gas and maybe even broke, no? But then they say, okay, but we also have something else here, minor, but still we have another detection of H alpha. And that was cool because we had something here, right? We couldn't say it because it was so close to the disk here, but there was some kind of, you know, prominence here. So we were like, ah, okay, then there's something. And then they told us H alpha. Okay, great. So we have both ingredients. That means that we have another planet here, we just have to see that's the second protoplanet in the same system ever detected. And in fact, with Alma, and then you know with Alma now you put the large dust grain, so we are probably a full dust, not the planet itself. But with Alma, we detected actually the Zella, we have many C, we detected PDS 70C. So that means the PS 70C has a circumplanetary disk. <coughs> planetary disk, a very tiny structure of dust that is basically accreting possibly onto the dust. So the, this planet is pretty full, right? You got your disk and you got your uh, accretion. So this is really a protoplanet, planet in the actual form. Yes. Why PS70B doesn't have a disk? Why does it have a simple planet disk? Yes. That's a good question. Really. No. It, it has way more, it's a, there's way more mass and way more H alpha, but possibly no simple planet disk. It's possible, you know, that you know, suggested probably a simple planet disk has already gone, it's already you know, creating the entirety of on the planet itself. Whereas this planet here is a bit late. So somehow there's still some mass that can be accreted onto this planet, which is less mass. So the HR could be in rejection instead of 
The chaffa could be both a Jackson and a Christian thing. Basically. For me, it would be an accretion, but then many people say, now actually, you have the idea of the micro jet from uh, a planet. It's not a great suggestion, no? As you have it from the star, basically, you can have jet from planets. So you have your accretion, and uh, I don't know if that was more than me about this, but in principle, we may also be detecting jet from, uh, from, from this planet here. Sure. But for sure, it's somehow a signature of accretion, because if you have a, a jet, you must have accretion. But we don't detect this in proprietary disk around PDS-70B. Anyway, all this to say, this great example here is a showcase of the synergetic environment of high contrast imaging in the visible and the near infrared thermal emission. Right, here we go. Accretion, here we go. And ALMA, you see proprietary dust. Here we go. <laughs> and these things put together, you get a robust detection of a protoplanet that you can really characterize. Okay, so ALMA alone is not enough. We alone are not enough. We need to really put our forces together in order to characterize the planet formation. All this is great. But the problem is that, yes? Yes. <clears throat> so uh, the data, uh, C and D, are not the same? Or <laughs> uh, it's two different uh, data sets. Two different resolutions. Uh, uh, taken at uh, which uh, delay between each other? Uh, oh, so yeah. it, can you detect the motion? Can you yeah. detect the motion of the planet? Yes. 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 So you can calculate the mass. Why not? One mass. A mass from the motion of the planet. Uh, uh, you can the mass of the star. The mass of the star. No, yes. the mass of the star. But if you know the, the, the type of the star, you know the mass more or less. Up. No, not so. <laughs> no, I think once. Yeah, when they the, the, the time, the orbital time is very long. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But also, I'm not sure you can really constrain the mass of the planet. I'm sure the mass of the star, but I don't know. What we do is simply take the photometry. So the model on your models of other planets from the photometry obtain the mass of the planet. The moment is what we have. And the big problem is that this is great, but this remains the only robust detection of other planet. Yeah. We have many more candidates. Some people consider other <laughs> kind of reliable, but they may all agree with me that none of them is comparable to this. This is a sure detection. All the others are are really candidates, I would say, at the moment. So, you know, all this to say that we need somehow to disambiguate these candidates uh, in order to understand what exactly, you know, for example, detection of orbital motion. That's very important for to be sure that that's a planet. But even there, you know, even at this. Um, take. So, you cannot be confused. So, this is all kind of complicated. So, final point the paucity of protoplanets, the absence of protoplanets ever detected, is the main mystery that we have in the field, right? Why should we detect in protoplanets and we are not? And, um, okay, this is, uh, you know, just a more, more complicated, just to show that Britain we should be detecting these planets in at least a few cases. So, you basically have the mass of a putative planet that may be responsible for the substructure that we see in different objects. We have these different objects with substructure, rings or rim or spirals. You can increase it with a model, calculate what could be the mass of the planet. You put it here on the x axis, so the mass of this perturber. You compare with the limit that we have from our survey. So we have a limit for the mass that we can actually detect. At least in some cases, they overlap. So, that means in principle, this object here we should be detected. This object here probably too low mass, but this we should be detected. So, all in all, we don't know. We don't know why we don't detect from the planets. My idea is that the extinction of the disk is the elephant in the room. So, you want to see visible optical photon, the yeah, infrared photon, but you know, your disk is basically extincting most of this light. And so going to longer wavelengths in the medium, for example, which is web or other instruments from the ground, there is a recently vibration, maybe the heat. That's my idea. But some other people believe maybe they're closer in because you know we cannot really observe this object here. So we don't have an answer. At the moment, it should be detected in this planet, but we are not. I'm going very quick on the third part, which is basically just to present a recent paper that I have, the cradle of the cradle of planets. This, you know, it's a press release. That we have had with uh, with ESO, so I was really happy with the interview by journalists, <laughs> so much journalists. And uh, so, what was the idea behind this? The idea was to switch from the individual study, so switch from the individual type of object, like for example, around uh, 
super solar massars or individual disks to a real survey of these being divisible for a specific performing regions. That's something that actually the ARMA people have already done in the past, but now with this resolution. Typically, when you have this large ARMA campaign, the resolution that you obtain is not comparable to our image most of the time. So the idea was to collect all the images that we have taken in 10 years, okay, so hundreds of objects, and collect them in three different regions, that Taurus, Ohio, and Camille, for which we have enough data. For example, in Taurus, we realize that we have 43 sources. And so we published these three papers here, Pisanginski, Arguna Vargo, and me. And uh, I'm just showing you some results pretty quickly, in particular on the Taurus, I was like, I mean. Uh, so you see, this is a collection distribution of the sources we have with all the different features. The census of Taurus confirms a variety of morphologies, so we have the asparas, we have rings, and so on. But something to keep in mind the typical disk is actually faint in the near infrared. I believe I actually have another. No, I don't have it. Yes, I have it. Can you see? This is kind of uh, the synopsis. So basically, the faint disk represents represent 65% of the total sample. So this very bright, fantastic disk that we are all used to, they actually represent the peak of the ice. But most disks are actually uh, very faint in the area. They are either small or somehow shadowed by the inner disk itself. Another very interesting thing, I think for me, is that when I put all this in space, and the special uh, distribution, and then you have bright disk, green, and faint disk environment. What do you see? You can see a sort of segregation, right? You get the central portion of Taurus mostly have faint disk, whereas in the periphery, here, here, you have a lot more brightness, right? What does it mean? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, one possible suggestion is somehow this is related to the formation history of the whole region. Maybe you first form these guys here, and then you form this out here, and so this has. I have more time to actually develop some structure. Some other people also know to say, yeah, but all, these are all higher stellar mass. You see the size here, these are all a little bit more higher stellar mass. So instead, it can be that this on the periphery you form more higher stellar mass, and therefore the evolution of the disk is different, whereas here they are low mass, and therefore the disk is more calm. So we don't know. But that's the kind of first uh, piece of evidence of this spatial segregation of this morphology, which is very see before. I believe. Okay, I'm going fast to conclude. So, Camillo, similar results. Here you have a clear analogy between non detection and binarity. I don't know whether any of you is interested in binarity in this group here, but basically, when you have two stars, these are typically much more elusive, from right? they are small to aided by the interaction, or they cannot really grow because of this spreading cannot really proceed, and so on. Finally, also Orion, similar results. Here you also see a dependency with the UV field because Orion you have higher mass stars. So the UV fields may actually also hinder somehow the growth of planets. So if you want to form planets, you have to also keep in mind that you must be in the right place in space, right? So we know here we don't have many, uh, we have any massive star across the sun, right? That's why we have life. Okay, conclusion, summary. First, this decade has been really the revolution for planet forming, uh, for planet formation in terms of high resolution images, thanks to these high contrast images, 8 million telescopes on the ground, and ALMA. The first thing is the characterization of planet, the characterization of planet forming disks, normal planet forming disks, not this super large disk that HSP see, the see, they are able to see. Find one of the results is somehow the ubiquity of substructures when you have uh, a distance bright enough. We don't know whether in fame this we actually have structure. In some cases, we think they are. And finally, the great discoverer of the planets, the first for the planets ever discovered uh, six years ago. So to conclude summary, which is for the near future. The characterization of is even smaller than this, right? We will have ELT very soon, so we can really probe a smaller this and maybe actually form it something like a solar system or so. The big video protoplanets, I don't know, it's kind of provocative. I'm pretty sure we will detect many more protoplanets. I'm not sure whether any star will have protoplanets, probably not, but I hope many more. And finally, that's the final goal, we're trying to connect this protoplanet with all this substructure, right? If you want to understand the planet formation, you may say whatever you want, but then in the end, if you don't know whether a planet is here, you don't know whether this ring here is in the planet or not. So the final goal would be really to connect this family population of protoplanets detected 
with the, the subtraction that we observe in this. And with this, I thank you very much. And that's two picks for me. This is from the VLD here, where I was observing that night. It's actually my observation was running at the time with a laser. Uh, and finally, the, the image of VLD this is from nearly one year ago. If you look at the image now, it's fully constructed. It's a huge dome here. It's amazing how fast they're they are going. This is from May uh, from last year, and there was no dome yet, and now there's a dome. So, you know, we are close to VLD that was also revolution on the field. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so you have said that uh, the spatial distribution that you have checked in Taurus shows that the brightest disks are maybe outside the densest part. Have you checked this in Orion also? Uh, good question. The honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I think this is really that wasn't anything like that. I think the problem is that we have uh, fewer objects, I think. They were only 23 compared to 43, somehow less reliable. And as far as I remember, I, we didn't see anything was clearly related to the distribution space. Certainly there was something with the human field, so there may be something. But even if there is, that is probably connected to the human field, right? So it's a uh, complication more. Yeah, you know, I'm uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about the H alpha? It looks, it looks to me like the section was very clean. So, is that also um, adaptive optics? Or um, could it be that this on the factor population of activating the planets could be actually detected if people invest a lot of time on adaptive optics H alpha imaging? Yeah, so this is really from uh, the optics, it's really from uh, abuse. So this is really located in the right place. In fact, in fact, many, many people invest the time on service of H alpha. The idea, you know, maybe you have your disk and then you got two spots of H alpha on the sour course, but really on the disk, maybe the ring, and that was the idea to try to detect indirectly the planet with H alpha. The problem remains, that is the problem I believe it is, H alpha is visible. So the extinction of the disk is extreme. I believe it was never quantified uh, directly, but I think it can be really time manual, as far as I know. It doesn't reason to believe it's not time manual. So even if you have your five months of the south, I don't know what, five months now, but you must consider it then maybe count 15 months just because of the disk. So all the service to actually try to detect the H alpha, I personally think they are at the moment they are useless because even if you have your HR permission, it would be completely eaten by the disk itself. So we need to go the longer way. When you say there's some lines along the way. When you say this, you say gas, or uh, mean the, the H alpha is uh, uh, by the gas or the gas? By the dust. By the dust. Exactly. So why don't you go to uh, uh, um, and observe all of them with the big, with these big uh, uh, gaps and the uh, transitions? Yeah, that would be the idea. Gaps, unfortunately, I think they are not uh, empty enough. Right. And never empty enough in any small dust. You always have a lot of dust in the gap. The cavity can be actually more empty, so that was prominent somehow. Uh, but we haven't found any. I mean, you don't have many, many transitions like this. You have some, you know, we probably had anti 35 disks are large enough, but not many. With DLT, maybe you can probe a smaller cavity and therefore closer in the clouds. Yes, Laura, we give it. So I actually have two questions and an announcement. Thanks. The announcement is there's an after, uh, after this meeting, all the students are invited to uh, room upstairs to discuss the colloquium. If you're available and interested, you're welcome to come. There will be pizza. <laughs> <laughs> the, the two questions uh, one is uh, this trail of training, so when was presented? How was the sample defined? It's just everything that everybody had observed, or was there some uniform criteria? Uh, we collected all the images that we have at the time, <clears throat> so there was no strategy at the time because you know we started with the bright objects in 2015 and 2015 and so on, and, uh, and then we sit together last year and we said, okay, what do we have? So we we'll, would we'll look at the full sample of objects ever imaged with our techniques in 10 years. 
And it turned out, for example, in Taurus, it's around 75% of the observable stars. Okay. Observable because when we work in the adaptive optics, I didn't mention this, you need the star to be relatively bright. Because you use the star in the computer that basically distort the mirror and provide basically adaptive optics, need the star to be relatively bright. Because if the star is not bright, the computer says, no, I need more photos, I cannot correct them. So we cannot observe relatively bright stars unless you have a laser. You have a laser, basically like the images I showed in the beginning, in the, in the final slide, then you can have even observation of a, of a lower mass star. But for now, for example, we cannot really program those. We are not talking about 0 0.1 or less uh, solar mass stars. We only probe in 0 0.4 solar mass stars and the whole. Yeah, my, my question, I have another question, yeah. actually, but my, my question was whether the, the way that the sample was selected, could it introduce a bias that could explain, for instance, this segregation? Yeah, segregation? no, we found no bias above 0 0.4 okay. solar masses. Solar okay. masses. Okay. So let's say about, if you, if you focus on this, there was no, no bias, because basically only on class two. So not embedded yeah. to this, but let's say if you focus on class two, around the uh, stars more massive than 0 0.4 solar masses, we found no bias. And the other question is, at the beginning of the talk, you said that the disks were rotating sub yeah. uh, the, the gas in the disk. Yeah. Is that because of viscosity? What, what is the physical? It is because of the, I believe, of the, uh, the gas pressure. Okay. Well, okay. potentially you have on the star, right? Maybe you guys know more than me about this. I think it's somehow related to the fact that with this pressure gradient due to the, the gravity somehow, so the pressure gradient induced the subcapillarity of the gas, whereas the dust is capillary and the fourth mass is somehow breaking. At some point, we believe we should actually find the location when you have the inversion actually of this, and somehow you are capable of collecting particles because of a pressure trap. Well, that's one of the explanations we have for this uh, um, meter barrier we have overcome, overcome. Basic idea, for example, you have more planets, this planet can actually, you know, induce a pressure trap and collect all the material. And so you form a second planet, and then the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. So everybody's like, how do you form, form the first? If you form the first, then the second is easy, the third one. But the first? Thank you. Will you? Yeah, um, very nice thought. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the desirability of moving to the mid-infrared in order to see deeper into these disks. Presumably, to get the resolution you need, JWST isn't enough. What sort of future uh, observatories could, could help you with? I'm very confident about the new instrument that we have now at VLT. It's called ELIS. ELIS is working in the L and that, so basically four and five micro. A, so the resolution is, of course, a bit worse, but I think the gain that you have in the extinction exerted by the disk is probably like one fifth of the uh, H and K band. So to one and two micro. So I believe that if you have a planet that say a 40 astronomical units from the star, so the resolution is pretty good, that planet you may see it at five micro with Eris, or this weapon principle, and not with the sphere working the age of the event. Problem is that if you want to go a little bit closer in, because the resolution is also worse, if the planet is, let's say, 15 AU or 20 AU, yeah, then this, you may lose it. So, can you, can you not do interferometry for that environment? And uh, it's to detect planet, I don't know, interferometry with the four antennas, this is super complicated. We don't have, you know, the eight antennas, or how many, six, 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 six. There is some effort to do VLT with VLTI, interferometry with VLT, but then you only have six base, right? Because you have four instruments, so six baseline, uh, three times two. And then the model is super model dependent. Yeah. So even only to actually detect the disk very close to the star, it's very degenerate with your model. And I believe to even detect planets, it, it has been tried, but it's, I guess, it's technically very challenging. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Director? Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. I have two questions. So for this H alpha emission that some people see, uh, could it be, could, Brown lithium burning brown dwarfs generate enough ionization to, to explain that. So you say that this is not a planet, but it's a brown dwarf. No, I'm gonna be right. Yeah, that's something that is small enough not to burn hydrogen, but 
Um, I, don't know what they do. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Is that generating no finalization too? I have no idea, honestly. I've heard about this. Some people believe that you know BDS70B is so massive it would be a brown dwarf instead of a planet. But I don't know why they're going to end the problems to do actually generating stuff. I have no idea about that. Yeah. The HR will be like reflection. Okay. We'll be sorry, what? Like reflection. Okay. The ESD um, should be big. Massive. Okay. Because it's the only one that yeah. has a debit. Yeah, yeah, and it has a, but, uh, but I don't know if it is a round or. Yeah. And since you have so much of creation for each other, putting the optical, what about radio recombination lights? Ha. Can, can that ionization be detected? Sure. Right? Possible. Possible. Maybe no. in TV a label. No, no, no. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. they have to. You are convincing me to come to the meeting here in November. Good. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, Ilaria Pascucci had this paper calculating the, the detection of the photo operating disk with radio recognition. But uh, a little planet, I think that's. But yeah, maybe, but we need to change resolution or to weak emission. We have to paint. What is a little planet like? Well, Jupiter. Yeah, I mean, this, yeah, the testing has a protoplanet in radio recognition. I, 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 currently, I, I would say it's impossible. Okay. But this wouldn't happen, I would be in the beach. What? What? This wouldn't happen, I would be in the beach. I don't <laughs> Any other question? Let's check in the room. Yeah, uh, no question in the room, Sula. Any question in the virtual world? Uh, Enrique has a question. Enrique. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. I'm Enrique Vasquez. And um, I, this is a question about theory, about the meter barrier. So I, I know you're an observer. So this is just uh, a question to ask you whether you know any gossip about the, the, the studies, the theoretical studies. But I was wondering, are uh, would you happen to know if if there have been studies considering electrostatic forces uh, in, in the dust that could lead to to breaking this meter barrier? Because it seems to me that those are the, and, and there must be a lot of friction going on between uh, just you just mentioned it. There's friction going on between the dust and, and the gas. So I wonder whether uh, electrostatic charges could develop that could lead to coagulation more rapidly than just by collisions and things like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, just to ask you whether you know anything about uh, models in this direction. I have no idea. Honestly, that could, in principle, even if it's true, and I have no idea, in principle, it could somehow uh, alleviate the second effect. So the fact that, you know, the encounter of these two particles may be somehow positive instead of negative, but you still have a problem of the time, right? You still have a problem of the drifting velocity of these particles. And, uh, you know, that's extremely rapid in principle for a meter particles if you don't stop it. So unless this process that you mentioned that I have no idea about, honestly, it's super efficient, but way more efficient than even micro size that screen. So you still need somehow to trap the particle. If you don't okay. trap particles, they are still too way too fast to actually uh conceive any any possible population among them i think okay thank you that, that, the most promising explanation is that when once you have centimeter millimeter uh, then it starts the uh, streaming instability the streaming instability is in principle is also is is uh, um is able to form bigger particles everywhere in the disk very rapidly very rapid very fast the but electrostatic forces would tend to be repulsive. Right? The electrostatic forces, I would have thought, would tend to be repulsive because they're only attractive if you have opposite charges. Right. So you need, by chance, to be able to charge something positively and something negatively, okay. which seems unlikely. You're more likely to charge everything mm -hmm. positively or charge okay. everything okay. negatively, in which case it will okay. compete. Uh, okay. And then, I think one is uh, the eyes, I don't know, the eyes lines, it's it tends to, to, to accumulate particles, but it is not clear if they pass the ice line or that they stop at the ice line. Right. And, and, and it is supposed that particles with ice, they are sticky. So, 
but in time you should see a, a correlation between location of the eyes yeah, and yeah. the substructure, and I think it's not quite seen yet. Another question? Another question from the virtual world? Uh, we do not have any more questions on Zoom. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>